Welcome to the discussion. Uh, so, John, you know, flashing back to February 2022 when the war broke out, uh, there were many debates about uh, the causes of the war, factors leading to the war, of course, a lot of uh, finger pointing and blaming at each other. And uh, you are known in the Western world as almost the lone voice in blaming U.S. Uh, obsession with the NATO expansion to Ukraine, uh, which you pointed out for years has been viewed in Russia as a grave threat to its national security. Are you still holding uh, that view? Yes, I think the conventional wisdom in the West has long been that uh, Vladimir Putin was an imperialist and he was determined to conquer Ukraine and make it part of a greater Russia, or he was interested in recreating the Soviet Union. There is no evidence to support that. And all the evidence indicates that he was fearful that the West was trying to make Ukraine a bulwark, a Western bulwark on Russia's border. And, and the principal element of the West strategy was NATO expansion into Ukraine. Putin and his advisors made it clear for many years that this was simply unacceptable and if the West continued to push NATO eastward into Ukraine, there would be serious trouble. And of course, that's exactly what happened. And I have no reason to change my view, because if you look at people in the West and people in Ukraine who talk about the possibility of a peace involving Ukraine and Russia, they automatically focus on the subject of NATO expansion and the question of whether Ukraine can be neutral. That tells me that my basic argument from the start was correct, that this is really, at its core, all about NATO expansion. Okay, NATO expansion. Now, with uh, you know, one year past, uh, almost past, about the war, uh, so do you see a you know, possibility still there for Ukraine, a membership for Ukraine? I think it's extremely unlikely. And I think that what's going to happen here uh, is that Ukraine is going to be turned into a dysfunctional rump state. And by that, I mean it's going to lose a big chunk of territory in its east. Uh, and furthermore, its economy is going to be wrecked. The Russians are in the process of trying to destroy Ukraine so that the remnant state that's left is so weak that it either cannot join NATO, or if it does join NATO, it's more of a problem for the alliance than it is an asset. Uh, what about the continuity or continuation uh, of military support from Washington, from Brussels, uh, or, you know, of uh, tanks or even probably uh, fighter jet uh, later on? And uh, do you see any signs of a fatigue, uh, either on European countries or on the U.S. side? I think that the West will continue to support the Ukrainians as much as possible. Uh, the West is deeply committed to this war. Uh, the view in the West is that uh, the United States and its allies cannot afford to lose. So I think we will continue to give the Ukrainians as much military aid as we can. The problem that the West faces and the Ukrainians face is that what they really need is artillery. This is a war of attrition and the key military system or the key weapon that matters in a war of attrition is artillery. And the Russians have a huge advantage in artillery. Some people estimate that the Russians have six to one or seven to one more artillery tubes than the Ukrainians have. And the problem the West has, it doesn't have the artillery tubes and the artillery shells to give to the Ukrainians. This is why we're giving the Ukrainians armored vehicles like tanks and infantry fighting vehicles, because we don't have the artillery to give them. But the problem is that tanks are not a good substitute for artillery, and we're not giving the Ukrainians that many tanks. So all this assistance from the West doesn't really add up to that much. 
What is needed here is artillery. One final point on this, there's talk now, as you know, about the West giving the Ukrainians fighter pilots uh, and giving, excuse me, the West giving the Ukrainians fighter aircraft uh, that their fighter pilots can use. Uh, this is not gonna help much at all. First of all, it's gonna take a long time to train Ukrainian pilots to fly those F-16s or whatever Western planes are given to the Ukrainians. But the other thing is that the Russians have the most formidable air defenses in the world, uh, especially weapon systems like the S-400. So I think even if the Ukrainians get some F-16s or other NATO aircraft, it's just not going to matter much. The fact is that they need lots of artillery uh, and they don't have that. And uh, the war is not going good at this point in time for the Ukrainians as a result. Mm -hmm. John, you said that the West is deeply committed to the war and they cannot afford to lose. Uh, but I would say probably it's the same for the Russians. They can't afford to lose the war. It's about their you know, existence as a nation. Uh, so what's the final game? You know? And at the same time, you know, we heard of the talk of nuclear war, the threat. Uh, seems to be increasingly, I'm not sure it's real, but uh, there's a threat of nuclear weapons. Well, I think there's no question that both the Russians and the West are deeply committed to winning this war. But I think that the Russians are more deeply committed. I think for the Russians, victory is more important than it is for the West. From a Russian point of view, what's happening in Ukraine is clearly an existential threat. They view it as a threat to their survival, and they have every intention of making sure that they do not lose, and indeed that they win this war. So you have here two sides that are deeply committed to winning, and the Russians are more deeply committed than are the Americans. What this tells you is number one, that it's hard to see how you can have any sort of diplomatic settlement to this war because both sides want to win and it's impossible for both sides to win. This is why most people think this war is going to go on for a long time. Second, there is a possibility that the West and the Ukrainians will succeed in winning on the battlefield in Ukraine and pushing the Russians back. And it will then appear to the Russians like they are about to lose the war. In that instance, there is a non-trivial chance that the Russians will use nuclear weapons to rescue the situation. So one never wants to lose sight of the fact that there is always a serious possibility that nuclear weapons will be used in this war. And it is most likely that they will be used if the Russians are losing. So we in the West are in this paradoxical situation where we are trying to defeat the Russians in Ukraine, but the more successful we are at achieving that goal, the more likely it is that nuclear weapons would be used. And that, of course, would be an unmitigated disaster. We do not want that to happen. All of this just tells you how much trouble we are in uh, regarding this uh, war in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. uh, well, uh, of course, you know, we used to know that uh, there's um, a basic theory of uh, mutually assured destruction. Uh, if one party uses uh, these nuclear weapons, the other party could uh, do the same. And then that's uh, destruction for both sides. Uh, is that still, you know, working as a deterrent uh, against either side? Somewhat. But you want to understand that there are two different scenarios where nuclear weapons can be used. One scenario is where the Russians use nuclear weapons against NATO. Uh, and in that instance, mutual assured destruction comes into play because obviously the West has nuclear weapons, the Russians have nuclear weapons, and there is a great danger in that situation that both sides would end up destroying each other. But the more relevant scenario at this point in time is where the Russians use nuclear weapons, not against the West, but they use nuclear weapons in Ukraine. 
against Ukrainian forces, and they use those nuclear weapons in a limited fashion. The Ukrainians do not have a nuclear arsenal of their own. So the Ukrainians cannot retaliate against Russia if Russia uses nuclear weapons in Ukraine. Therefore, mutual assured destruction does not apply in that scenario. And the Russians are likely to think that they can get away with using nuclear weapons. Now, one might say, if the Russians use nuclear weapons in Ukraine, the West will then retaliate with its own nuclear weapons to defend Ukraine. I do not believe that will happen. Uh, and uh, the French president, Macron, has said that that would not happen. So in a very important way, the great danger here is that the Russians are losing on the battlefield in Ukraine, and they use nuclear weapons in Ukraine, thinking that the West will not respond with nuclear weapons, and therefore we can avoid a mad situation. Uh, well, in any sense, uh, we are going to see uh, uh, I mean, the tension, the situation go, uh, continue uh, to escalate before, I mean, we see an uh, end scenario, uh, either a peaceful negotiation or and whatever pressure, uh, you know, <laughs> due to probably both sides, they are tired of fighting, then there will be a, a pause or stop. I'm not sure about that. You want to remember that World War I went on from 1914, from August 1914 until November 1918. And the number of people who were killed in World War I was very great. Uh, so it's not clear to me that this war will end anytime soon because the two sides uh, get tired of fighting. Again, you want to remember that for the Russians, they believe they're facing an existential threat. And when you think you're facing an existential threat, you in effect fight to the death. And the West is furthermore deeply committed to this war. Uh, so it's hard to see the West quitting, especially since Western soldiers are not involved. Uh, if anybody is going to get uh, battle weary and think about quitting, it's not the West, it's the Ukrainians. And the Ukrainians, of course, view what's happening as an existential threat themselves. So the Ukrainians have a deep seated interest in fighting to the death. Uh, so when you look carefully at this, it's very hard to see how it comes to an end unless the Russians begin to score major victories on the battlefield and the Ukrainian military collapses, or unless the Ukrainians begin to win on the battlefield and the Russians use nuclear weapons, in which case both sides would go to great lengths to shut the war, uh, shut the war down very quickly. But neither one of those two scenarios that lead to a end to the war look likely at this point in time. And what appears to be likely is that you're going to have a protracted war. Mm -hmm. A protracted war. Uh, what about the effects of the war? You know, of course, we, you know, we understand that there will be impact on uh, the generations of the Ukrainians and uh, the Russians, at least this generation. And uh, of course, what about the effects of on European countries? This is a war in the European continent. And the European countries uh, are basically almost cutting their relationship uh, with Russia. And uh, what does the future be like? Well, I think if you look at the consequences of this war uh, for Europe, uh, it's a, a very uh, disturbing uh, picture. Uh, I think that relations between Russia and Europe, and this includes not just Eastern Europe, but Western Europe, uh, are now poisonous. Uh, whereas the Russians and the Germans had had very good relations for decades uh, Russian-German relations are terrible. And there's no evidence that relations between Russia and the West are going to improve. And in fact, the Russians are going to have an incentive to cause all sorts of problems in Europe because they view the Europeans as their enemy. Uh, and the Europeans, of course, view the Russians as their enemy. So both sides are going to have uh, all sorts of incentives to cause the other side trouble. And this means that uh, it's hard to see how you're going to get a stable and peaceful Europe 
uh, in the foreseeable future. Now, one very important element in the equation is whether or not you get a meaningful peace to end this conflict at some point in the not too distant future. I think it's more likely that you'll end up with a frozen conflict than with a meaningful peace treaty. So I think this conflict uh, could lead to a situation where both sides stop shooting at each other, but the situation is not peaceful at all. And in fact, it looks a lot like the cold peace between North Korea and South Korea. And if that's the case, uh, you know, relations in Europe, stability in Europe, uh, are going to be in terrible shape uh, for the foreseeable future. Yeah, for decades, probably. Uh, not that long ago, you were uh, at a debate about the solutions to the crisis. Uh, you uh, talked about uh, two alternatives. Uh, one is, uh, uh, you know, a neutral uh, Ukraine. Uh, the other is uh, to follow the Biden administration to double down on the sanctions on Russia. And uh, tell us more about that, your choice in particular. Well, I believe the only way out of this war and the only way to create uh, any semblance of stability in Europe is for Ukraine to become a neutral state, for Ukraine to give up its aspirations to become part of the West, uh, to give up on its aspirations to become a Western bulwark on Russia's borders. Uh, the Russians will accept nothing less. Uh, so if we want to end this conflict, we have to move to neutrality, uh, a neutral Ukraine. But there's no evidence that's going to happen. It's unacceptable to the Americans. Uh, and instead, what the Americans and their allies are doing is they're doubling down at every turn. And this is why you see so much escalation in this conflict. Uh, the Americans are looking for ways to defeat the Russians in Ukraine and to badly damage the Russian economy. What the Americans are trying to do is they're trying to knock the Russians out of the ranks of the great powers. This, of course, is why, from Russia's point of view, uh, what the West is doing represents an existential threat. And we do more and more every week to up the ante. And all this does is cause the Russians to do more and more to up the ante. So both sides are upping the ante more and more each week. You have this spiral mechanism at play. Uh, and in no way is this likely to lead to a neutral Ukraine, which again is the only way out of this crisis. So where this all ends at this point in time is hard to say, but it doesn't look like it's going to end up in a neutral Ukraine, and therefore it doesn't look like it's going to end up with a meaningful peace agreement. Well, some say we are moving to a multipolar world, and of course with uh, Russia uh, basically defying the U.S. will and uh, the rise of uh, the rest. Let's say, you know, if you look at the global south, uh, China, India, uh, South America, Brazil, you know, basically countries uh, in the developing world, they are not following the Western countries to impose sanctions on Russia. And then they refuse to take sides on the war. And uh, so they are choosing a neutral uh, status in terms of the Ukraine conflict. Do you see there's a rise of a multipolar world? Uh, uh, if that's the case, you know, what's the impact of the war on the global order? I think there's no question that we are in a multipolar world. I believe we have been in a multi-world, multipolar world since roughly 2017. And when I say we're in a multipolar world, I believe there are three great powers on the planet, the United States, China, and Russia. Uh, I believe Russia is the weakest of those three great powers. Uh, and I believe that China is a peer competitor to the United States. Uh, one does not want to underestimate uh, how powerful China is and how much potential power it has. And this is why the United States has long been interested in pivoting to Asia. So you have three great powers at play in the system. We are in a multipolar world. Uh, unipolarity is behind us. Uh, now, given the Ukraine war, what's happened here is that uh, America's ability 
to win friends around the world uh, has diminished. It's really quite remarkable. Um, there's no question that in the West, uh, relations between the United States and its European allies and relations between the United States and Japan and South Korea have improved as a result of the Ukraine war. And the West looks more united than ever. But given what the United States is doing in Ukraine, uh, it's quite clear that outside of the West, most countries are not sympathetic to the United States at all. And in fact, they're reasonably, if not very hostile to the United States. I think the best example of this is India. Uh, before the Ukraine war, it looked like India and the United States were going to join together to form a quite tight balancing coalition against China. Uh, but once the Ukraine war broke out, given the history of good relations between Russia and India, the Indians have been very reluctant to side with the United States in any meaningful way against Russia. And indeed, one could argue that the Indians are siding with the Russians against the Americans over the Ukraine war. This has ramifications for the United States' ability to contain China, because India was supposed to be a key player in the balancing coalition against China. So if you look at what's happening as a result of the Ukraine war, what you see is that outside the West, the United States is not doing very well in terms of winning influence and, uh, and getting countries to line up on its side against China. Well, uh, you said the U.S. is not doing that well in winning friends. What happened, you know, uh, because the Trump administration certainly is gone and we have the Joe Biden administration here. Well, the fact is that the Biden administration is, I think, on balance, somewhat more aggressive and somewhat more hawkish uh, than the Trump administration was. Donald Trump, for all his faults, was not a warmonger. Uh, Donald Trump did not start any wars. Uh, and uh, he makes the argument, and it may be true, that if he were the president instead of Joe Biden, that there would be no war in Ukraine. Uh, we can never know for sure whether that's true. But it does get at the point that Trump was, he was certainly hawkish towards China, and he was certainly interested in containing China. There's no question about that. But other than his policy towards China, he was not remarkably hawkish by any means. Joe Biden, on the other hand, is hawkish across the board. He is, uh, he is very, uh, very interested in pursuing an aggressive foreign policy. And by the way, if you look at American policy on Ukraine from January 2021, when President Biden moved into the White House up until when the war broke out in February of 2022, what you see is that Joe Biden was becoming much more aggressive on the Ukraine issue than Trump had been. And it was Biden's aggressiveness on the Ukraine issue that played a key role in leading to the war breaking out on February 24th of last year. So you do not want to underestimate how aggressive Biden was toward Russia on the Ukraine issue. And of course, he's been every bit as aggressive towards China, if not more aggressive toward China than uh, his predecessor, Donald Trump was. So it's just important to understand that even though Trump is gone, the United States has not become less aggressive on the foreign policy front. Mm -hmm. uh, what about Russia, uh, John? You know, uh, Russia, obviously, uh, they are having uh, probably less and less relationship with the European uh, countries, uh, which they previously enjoy uh, a lot in terms of trade. Uh, but now they are turning to Asian countries, for example, or Africa. Uh, so in a couple of years now, they are quite weak economically because of the sanctions. Uh, what about, uh, you know, in three years time or in five years time? Uh, are their relationship with, uh, with China, India, other Asian countries going to, uh, I mean, replace or at least uh, 
fill this, um, the empty room you know, left probably in their relationship with the European countries? I think that has to happen. Uh, it's hard to imagine uh, trade relations between Russia and Europe going back to what they were uh, before the war broke out. Uh, and that's especially true of German-Russian relations. It is possible that those relations, those trade relations will improve somewhat in the distant future, but I think it's going to take a long time for that to happen. And in the meantime, the Russians have very powerful incentives uh, to replace their trade relations, uh, their lost trade relations in Europe uh, with increased trade relations with countries like India and countries like China and countries in places like Africa. And you see much evidence of that already happening. And I think you'll see more of it moving forward. You know, there's a great deal of talk in the West about the fact that sanctions have failed. There's no doubt that sanctions have hurt the Russian economy somewhat, but not very much, nowhere near as much as people expected. And one of the reasons for that is that the Russians have been have been able to replace their trade relations uh, or their trade with the West, with trade with other countries to include uh, China and India. Well, you know, the latest uh, uh, news being that uh, the U.S. Uh, bombed this Nord Stream 2 pipeline. Will that have any effect on Washington's relationship with Brussels? I don't think so. Uh, I think uh, the key question is whether or not it will have an effect on U.S.-German relations, because Nord Stream belonged to the Germans and the Russians, not to Brussels. And the question is, what will the Germans do? Uh, it's you know difficult to say for sure, but my guess is that the Germans will complain somewhat but in the end, the Germans will not complain too much because the Germans are in good part subservient to the Americans. The Americans basically call the shots in Europe. And when you're involved in a war over Ukraine and the Germans are allied with the United States against Ukraine, and when the United States provides security for Germany, you have a situation where there are real limits to what the Germans can do in terms of complaining about the whole Nord Stream uh, experience. So I, I don't think it's going to matter that much in the end. Mm -hmm. Well, on that note, we conclude today's show. Many thanks to Professor John Jay, Mirza Hammer.